Nu, ihr will Tage her in der Meise, unsere Familie, of our family, and our little boy. It may take some chutzpah, because the path of our aunts and uncles was never easy. The family can be traced to pre-war Poland. They were resilient, hard-working people, Polish Jews. But where had they come from? Nobody knew. And how did they go about their lives? Nobody cared. My ancestors survived many ordeals. They were carpenters, uh, chicken farmers, blacksmiths, insurance people, bookkeepers, and even though they were crushed down countless times, they usually recovered and carried on. At some point, my mother sent me a sheaf of letters that my grandmother, her mother, had received from Poland in the years between 1939, when they left, and 1941. And the letter stopped in 1941. So I asked my mother, what happened? You know, why did the letter stop in 1941? She said, in 1941, they rounded up all the Jews remaining in the ghetto in Ostrowiec, which is the town where the family came from. And they were trained in cattle cars to Treblinka, and that was the end of them. I started receiving pictures from relatives. You know, this is your great-grandmother, this is your great-grandfather. Your great-grandmother was married to two men. Here's one of them. We don't know if he was your great-grandfather or not. You know, these puzzles started coming up. Being far from perfect, I often asked myself, who am I and uh, why am I here? And to try to gain some wisdom by learning from others and about others, including my own ancestors. I realized there are certain genetic resemblance between their face and mine. So I kind of started conceiving them as full flesh and blood human beings rather than cardboard cutouts called grandparents, great grandparents on the wall pictures. And then I had the sense that artistically perhaps I could project myself into their lives. And perhaps if not get to know them any better than I already did, but that artistically I could suggest to other people that this may be a voyage worth taking on, that in some way we carry those people within us, right? That they're written on our face, genetically and also historically. At the time I was doing self-portraiture, but I was creating fictitious historical figures. And uh, it occurred to me that it wouldn't be a big jump to jump from official history to private personal history and instead of doing a fictitious historical figure that I would do one from my own history. I decided to set up to do a couple of my official ones and then do one from my private history, one that I could remember quite clearly, my maternal grandfather, my mother's father. I spent my entire life prior to this project behind the camera and I reserved the discomfort of being in front of the camera for everyone else involved and for the first time I had to step in front of the camera and perform, and performing was not something that I was comfortable with. Least of all, performing in costume with wigs and makeup on me, and I felt incredibly insecure about it. I had severe misgivings about the success of such a thing. 
I'm glad that Jean is not here because I think mm -hmm. she'd be a little bit amused too. That's your way? Mm-hmm. You can go home and get a big wet kiss with the <laughs> I think I'll do that. And of course, later on, seeing myself transformed in the mirror into an assortment of younger and older men, younger and older women, I became more comfortable with it, but I never thought of myself as being any kind of performer in any kind of a serious way. And I did the best I could, despite the discomforts of having to get into costume, of having makeup put on, of shaving my head, of shaving my beard and my mustache, of having to walk around with a hat permanently because I didn't want to let people see that half of my head was shaved and the other half was not. I can't say that at any time that experience was comfortable or natural to me. Raphael is really one of the foremost contemporary photographers in Canada. His works are represented in major museums throughout the world, the MoMA in New York, the Houston Museum in Texas, the Bibliothèque in Paris, and of course the National Museum in Ottawa. <laughs> I and my family was an important body of work. He spent years researching members of his European family and selecting figures, people, personalities from this research that he was doing. In each photograph, you actually can feel the personality of the person he's portraying. They're very strong. One is a suffragette, and you have to really understand that this is a man who has makeup on that's doing this portrait, but it's a wonderful study of a strong woman. In viewing it, it's almost like theater in photography. It was a, really a labor of love. He was trying to capture his past as a legacy for his son, perhaps. Do you remember doing all this stuff? Yeah. Do you? Yeah. And what did you think about it then? Uh, I thought you were crazy. Yeah. yeah. What about it was so crazy? The fact that you were uh, dressing up like uh, men one day and women the other. Uh-huh. And, and do you remember going to the costume shop with me? Mm, once or twice. Yeah. Do you remember running around with fake breasts all over? No. 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 That was probably the most fun part of taking you there. <laughs> no. I think it's important to look back in the past to find out who you are, but at this stage of my life I'm more about looking forward instead of looking back. You know, their faces are written all over yours. Can't see it. Well, you know, I was born in Chile in the early 1950s, and my parents are Chilean. You know, even though my mother was born in Poland, she got to Venezuela at age eight, and she got to Chile at age 10, and, you know, childhood was the rich experience. Surrounding us was the more popular Latin music. My parents grew up with that. They would dance tango, and paso doble, milongas, and all these other things. It was rich and it was sunny and it was lovely. It was a beautiful growing up. Well, you gotta understand that I was born in 1953, five years after the, the, the consolidation, the creation, the coming to be of the State of Israel. And this was a big deal. So it, it was kind of a natural thing for me when I finished my high school education to want to go live there. It was also when I took a camera into my hands for the first time and started shooting, all in black and white. Then I fell in love with it. With the process of images hitting the eye and the brain, I realized that this is what I wanted to do all my life, to become a photographer. There was an art college in Jerusalem where I could study photography, but I was more interested in exploring the wider world. And so I didn't 
take that too seriously and instead of staying in Jerusalem, I moved to Canada. For a guy from Chile, recently arrived from Israel, Toronto was different. It was fresh, conservative, interesting, diverse. After a while, I started making new friends uh, once I entered into Ryerson. And uh, my roommate for a few years there was Ed Brutinsky, today a well-established, world-famous Canadian photographer. I remember Raf's entry portfolio being so much better than mine, I was a little jealous. He had all these pictures from Jerusalem and these exotic places and, you know, women in these black saris that were just uh, beautifully done and articulated and printed well. And I thought, wow, this guy's really got some talent. But we became very close friends and we really pushed each other when we were going through uh, first and second, third years. We'd regularly be there until two or three in the morning comparing our prints and, and trying to get the best we could get. Raf was the only guy I knew back in 76 who went to see a psychoanalyst and he was always trying to parse his own personality. His identity was hovering somewhere between the kibbutz in Israel and his, where his parents lived in Mexico City and his new home in Toronto. Hola, mamá. Hola, mijito. Habla Rafa. Mamita, quería decirte que nos vemos este verano. Ajá. Ok, en mayo, junio nos vemos. En mayo, junio no nos vemos. Exacto. ¿Cómo estás? Me encanta. ¿Cómo estás? Te... No solamente que... que, que no, no. ¿Te sientes mejor? Normalmente de mi grupo. Me encanta. Ah, ¿Cómo estás? Bueno, que yo... ¿Cómo? Que no, que no, no, que no se lo diga otra vez. ¿Cómo? My move to Israel, followed a couple of years later by my parents' move to Mexico, created a sharp break from my childhood and adolescence. Chile, Israel, Canada, really was a lot, even for a young guy like me. Hola, hola. Hola, Rafa, qué sorpresa. In a way, this new reality of my parents leaving my homeland definitely closed the door on my childhood. I was already living in Toronto and I was still missing my Latin American culture terribly. Yet I couldn't go back for many years for a number of reasons. Dictatorship, costs. I had no family there. The main reason though was that I wasn't ready, mentally. I was kind of rootless and fragmented inside. When I finally returned many years later, my heart and body started reconnecting quickly. I felt like a lost child who found his way home, and I started photographing everything. It was a truly emotional experience. As always in life, every bad thing can be turned into something good. The images I took in Latin America were about what I felt and saw when I returned, when I started discovering or recognizing this particular part of my culture. From them, uh, I was able to assemble an exhibition and later on a book titled Nostalgia for an Unknown Land. I know today what I did not know then that this was really the beginning of my career in photography. And then, 
my life changed profoundly. We met at Women's College Hospital because at the time he was working in the media department and I was a general floor nurse. And the more I got to know about him, because my best friend was Chilean, and she then said to me, you know, I have this Chilean friend who actually works in the hospital. And I said, who's that? And she said, Raphael. So I invited him for a ride in my cabriolet. I invited him with the top down in my car. <laughs> and that got him. It was kind of love at first sight. It took off, and within three years, we were planning on getting married. And in 1991 was when our son Michael was born. Sweaty Betty. What next? <laughs> <laughs> you, son, should always remember what is said in the scriptures. Ye shall impress the commandments on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. You know, Jean is Irish and I'm Jewish. Some of the rabbis around here didn't really feel like validating this uh, combination. We had to go looking for a more liberal congregation and we found one, and in it some really wonderful people. We also found out through that that we were not the only ones with this particular issue. We celebrate both of them, which is uh, really nice. And it's good for Michael, because he gets the best of Hanukkah and Christmas and Good Friday and Passover. How do you like the Christmas carol background? I like, I like. <laughs> it's a lot of fun, actually, because when we first moved into this house, the first year we were here, we hosted a Hanukkah party. And, you know, I was the only Gentile amongst all these Jewish women, and I had to make latkes. And my biggest dilemma, all week, every night, there was latkes so that I could practice on <laughs> getting them to taste them and figure out which was the best recipe. But I welcome it. I, I really like it. We go to all the major events, mm -hmm. and Michael had his bar mitzvah, and um, it's really been a real eye-opener for me as well. Baruch <laughs> Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kichanu bemitzvotav, vetsivanu lehadlik ner shel chanukah. Imi an kalchen, imi an dorichen, imi an maran banos dorichen, being married to an Irish woman, I now have an Irish family. This family provided me from the early days with a rather rare opportunity to feel like an outsider. I hadn't felt like an outsider for many years and uh, it took me by surprise. People had accents, especially the older folk, they had thick Irish accents. They always smiled, so I figured whatever they were saying was kind but I could only understand about a third of what they said to me. And the turns of phrase and the sayings were things that I just didn't share with them. So I felt utterly incompetent and disconnected culturally. In an environment where I had very little in common with people, I decided to take a step back and bring my camera into it as a way of One more. connecting with my new in-law family. And I started taking photographs, very different kinds of photos, very realistic photos that reflected my feelings about myself and towards them at different times in our relationship. He's doing a family project with me and my two sisters. 
so everybody knows that if you're going to serve dinner, you better delay a little bit because Raphael's going to bring out his camera and he's going to get the girls outside and line us all up. And I think they would just like to see a finished project of this work because he's constantly taking photographs of them, but they don't actually see a completed work of art. These photographs I'm um, not always appreciated for, not always loved for. Many of the photographs that I've taken I don't show because I, I know that they would displease some people. But I have felt these were necessary photographs for me to mediate my relationship with my in-law family through what I know how to do best. Music has been a big part of my life, and the same with literature. And when Michael was born, in his growing up years, we stressed literature, we read to him constantly. But more than that, we played a lot of classical music. <laughs> I think I mostly correct my dad when we play together, just because at school, our conductor is very picky with uh, what we do in our ensemble, so I end up a lot of the time telling him uh, this needs to be louder, or don't jump in too early, and yeah, I feel like I kind of lead it a bit. So I'm just gonna say the same thing, I'm just gonna say, because you're still not doing it, you gotta look at me when you come in there. Okay, you're the boss. Mm -hmm. He showed an aptitude for music very early on, and he started playing piano. And of course, it was going to be classical piano. But as he grew into his adolescence, he evolved almost in resistance against our push for him to become a classical musician. He started wanting to play other stuff. Eventually, he got on the computer and started composing beats and hip hop music. <laughs> music that I don't necessarily like to listen to and that I get frustrated with. I've never really uh, thought of myself as going into playing classical music. I'm doing my Royal Conservatory music uh, exam in grade nine. So after that, I don't think I'm gonna do another one. He's almost evolving his musical identity in reaction or against me rather than with me, which is okay, I suppose, but not exactly comfortable. Como? Todavía no he podido, no he tenido mucho tiempo de leerlo más. Pero muy bueno, muy, muy bueno. A ver si por ahí lo leo cuando llegue a México. Claro que sí. Ok, te mando un abrazo. Gracias, mi amor. Y besos. Chao. 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 She remembers some things and not others. My mom is losing her memory. First of all, her short-term memory. She's getting disoriented and she doesn't remember people sometimes, or she thinks that some people are other people. She thinks my father is her father. She thinks I am my father. All of this is very upsetting, especially when she thinks I'm my father. I've always had a bit of a difficult relationship with my mother, who doesn't. She's a psychologist. That should tell you everything. She's highly intelligent, also highly critical, and highly temperamental. So we've had many fights now, my mother is looking really fragile and not quite the formidable opponent that I had throughout my life. She still wants to fight now, but obviously she's not in the position to, to, to win. Um, and that really is um, 
It's a sad thing. I picked up your book, Raphael, and came to this picture at the very end in which you say there are unknown members of uh, your family. This is the original uh, photo, and they're not unknown to me because they happen to be my father, my two aunts, and my two uh, uncles. So I knew we were related. This is the original for this picture here. That's in that the original photo taken in Warsaw in 1927. Which means the source for the photograph I'm using here must have been you somehow. So I'm the source, uh, and it came to you through circuitous means. Mm -hmm. This is Lublin. This is Poland as it was uh, 110 years ago. So Ustilog is where um, David Ritten, our and common ancestor. And that is where our common ancestor uh, came from. Uh, there is a river here called the Bug, and that's where Ustilog uh, was. And uh, if you're interested in finding out about the origins of your uh, family, you can't do it sitting in Toronto or in London. You have to go here. You have to uh, travel to uh, Poland, where you'll find the places, the records, uh, the roads, and the landscape. Now, Poland and Polish are very formal. Uh, it's a very formal society and a very formal language. But there are a few pointers uh, if you want to be accepted. Learn three key words. The first one is przepraszam, which means sorry, I apologize for my existence. I have to intrude on you, but bear with me. Whatever you start, say przepraszam. So, so how, how do you say that? Przepraszam. Whatever you say, say przepraszam. Very good. Przepraszam. Almost. Uh, if you try it a hundred times, you'll get it right. Eyes, so. <laughs> How do you say sorry for existing again? Uh, psha, psha prashim. Psha prashim. The second word is proshe, and uh, that is please. Say please all the time. And if you don't say please, say jinkuye, and that's thank you. Jinkuye. 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 Yeah. He says here, you may thank someone even before mentioning what you will be thanking him for. Jinkuye. <laughs> Have a great trip. Bye. I'll miss you. I'll miss you too. I wanted to take Michael to Poland with me because at the time he was lacking specific direction in his life. And I felt that by going to Poland, I wanted to, to help him become a man shaped by his past. Oh, you're still in bed. We've got a big day happening today. Hmm? We're all jet lagged and uh, that doesn't help and last night was not a great night. All right, I'm gonna go get some breakfast. When I come back, you're gonna be up, right? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've heard uh, Bobby talk about Ostroviets, you know, when I was a kid. And uh, I formed this image in my mind about it, and now I get to see what it really looks like. So to be sharing it with you is really important to me. Dzień dobry. Dzień dobry. Cieszę się, że spotkaliśmy się wspólnie w Ostrowcu. Bo te listy, które pan przysłał do mnie, posłużyły mi do zbadania historii pana rodziny, która zamieszkiwała w okresie międzywojennym w Ostrowcu Świętokrzyskim. Nie tylko z dokumentu poznał, ale również poznał na mapie. Właśnie to jest ten dom, gdzie mieszkała pańska rodzina i w innym miejscu też drugie miejsce, w którym zamieszkiwali. To jest ulica Bałtowska, o, wjeżdżało się na podwórko i jeden z tych domów był numer 5 i tu się urodziła twoja mama. So what he's saying, Michael, is that um, this is the Bałtowska street where uh, Bubi and, uh, and her grandparents lived before they left to Venezuela, right? And that number 5 represents the house where she lived, which is in this area. So right. this is where Booby was born, and this is where she grew up until she was seven when she left. You think she'd remember it? I don't know. I, I think she'd remember some aspects of it. She'd remember what it looked like. 
what the inside of the house would look like, but I don't think she would remember the whole thing. Tu w tym budynku numer 15 mieszkał twój pradziadek. To jest ten budynek na mapie, ten. Number 15 tak. Renek Street. Tak. This is where Bubi's grandparents lived after Bubi left and before they were taken away to Treblinka. This was the center of the of the Jewish town of Ostrovia. These are all buildings that Bubi would have seen as a child because this been a place where she would have been brought by her mother. Twoja rodzina mieszkała tu. Over there. Tak. To jest tu. Mm -hmm. It's not so much a feeling of sadness that came over me while I was standing there. It was more of a weirdness. I felt very connected to the place in a way, and at the same time, I felt very detached. It's hard to believe that something so evil happened then and now that place is so peaceful and serene. What I always felt was that he should be able to integrate his Jewish roots, his Jewish history into himself and for it to be part of who he thinks he is in the world. It's an interesting thing to, to be Jewish. It's uh, beyond blood, it's a culture, it's a civilization. It's a way of being in the world and it's singular and our place in the world almost has been allocated to us by other people. We have never been ignorant of what goes on in the world around us. In a way, it's the opposite. We are acutely aware of what goes on in the world around us. And from time to time, we fail to read the signs. I went to Poland because I wanted to see it for myself. Having so much knowledge about what happened there before the war, after the war, I wanted this to be part of my life. And I wanted it also to be part of Michael's life. It was already part of my mother's life. I also wanted to go see the place where my whole family was murdered, along with the rest of their town. And I wanted to reflect on the fact that had my grandfather not left six years before, and convinced my grandmother to leave almost on the eve of the war with my mother in tow, Michael and I would not have been standing on that train platform at Treblinka 70 years later. That was a very special moment for father and son to bond together. After that, we went to Israel, and that's a completely different story.
So you were looking out at this same scenery 36 years ago? Yep, I was from 1970 to 75. This is what I looked on. There's a few things that have changed, but in this place, things change very quickly. This place is wired to the rest of the world and anything that happens here, the rest of the world feels it and this place changes accordingly. What does it look like to you? Oh. <laughs> Seeing it for the first time. Well, it looks old to me, but I mean, I wasn't here 30 years ago. I'm sure if I come here 30 years from now, it'll look a lot different than it does now and I'll be saying the same thing, so. Yeah, I agree. It's beautiful though. It is gorgeous. Being in Israel made me realize how much I had changed from the days I was a carefree, penniless, young South American hippie in Jerusalem. It was difficult, especially trying to pass some of my history on to Michael and realizing that in a few very short years, he has become his own person, young and independent, and very different than I. So we're looking now at the end of your high school years, right? We're passing. We're, you just graduated from high school. What's your plan for the future? I don't know. Well, this is the time to think about it. You're in Israel. People here work pretty hard, Michael. Yeah, I understand that. They don't have the luxury to say, I don't know. They got to know what to do, right? We're in a place where that kind of luxury doesn't exist. So can you put yourself in that place? No. You are now where I was at 18. So I don't need to think about it. You're the one who needs to think about it. I'm there to help. I'm there to listen. I'm there to give you my opinion. I'm there to support. But you're the one who has to make those plans. That's called becoming a man. Yeah. Well, the thing is, it's hard to make plans when you're telling me, well, it's not going to work out. You know? I'm not sure how important it is that the Latin people might say that I'm not Latin enough because I don't speak Spanish. I don't dance the tango. And then the Polish people might say, I'm not Polish enough because I don't know a lot about my Polish ancestry. And you have the Jewish people saying that I'm not Jewish enough because my mother is a Catholic. And then there's the Irish people saying I'm not Irish enough because I practice Judaism. So I guess I have to find my own place. I'm comfortable where I am right now in a reformed Jewish community. I just consider myself part Irish, part Polish, part Chilean Jew. <laughs> Beautiful. Move foot over, <laughs> that's good. Move face this way. A little more. That's good. That's the pose I want you to do, okay? Look right when my hand is up here. Beautiful. That looks cool. It does look <laughs> cool, but I think we're gonna turn your face a little bit more uh, to get a little more light on that cheek there, and then we're just perfect, okay? And I'm gonna get you to turn over until I see the light on that cheek. Ah, now you're, now, now you're there. 
okay? Stay in that position. Can we do another Polaroid? You think you have the patience for another Polaroid? Do I have a choice? No, not really. <laughs> okay, let's work on it now. Let's get back into the same pose. Morning, everyone. Teaching is another form of do doing creative work, work, passing on knowledge in such a way so that somebody can absorb it and evolve in their, in their own direction. All right, so let's get in there. You all have the file that I distributed? And uh, I just want to review some of the steps that I created. Like in any good cooking show, uh, I prepared some of the ingredients for you so things have got a reasonable taste. And some of the stuff you guys already know, we're going to review it, and then we're going to get into today's material. Okay. To watch that evolution so in a student, one, to watch their growing mastery, uh, growing competence, is deeply satisfying. Of course, you know, we could go a little further with this, and we could create some eye highlights, and we could replace the catch light with a nicer catch light, so you all know how to do this. Each one of them is a singular person who has something to contribute. But for that something to really truly come out, they have to shed all the conventionalities. They have to shed all of this varnish that people acquire in society. They have to get to the center of what makes them who they are. And then find a language that enables them to do that. That's a lifelong quest. But I'd like to send them in that way, in that direction, knowing that they will take some time to get there. Time passes quickly. I'm getting to the point where looking at my mother and looking at her decline and how she is forgetting everything, everything that was her, everybody whom she knew, who she, she could name, recognize, her memories are all going. I'm realizing how fragile we are and how fragile, I suppose, I am. ¿Quién es este muchacho ahí? Este, este es mi hijo. Por supuesto. ¿Cuál? ¿Cuántos hijos tienes? Cuatro. Mírame los dedos. Dos, dos hijos. Dos hijos. Dos, dos. ¿Uno se llama? Ese. ¿Cómo se llama? ¿No te acuerdas quién es? Este. Uh -huh. Este. Franz. No, em empecemos por este. Sí, está aquí a uno. ¿Qué te parece? ¿Quiénes son estas dos personas? This puts into perspective everything that I've done so far and it changes my, my value system. I think that what I used to hold as completely important isn't so important anymore. What's important now is my family, my, my wife, my son, my parents, my relationships, the world in which I live in, rather than success and material goods.
I've uh, thought from time to time about what uh, propels me, what the impulse is for uh, making the pictures that I do. And the answer that keeps on coming back, it's uh, a bit perhaps simple-minded, but really is an effort to understand my own life in relation to the world. It's slipping away second by second and making pictures that help me understand what's going on. If you look at what he's done over the years, that uh, his artwork was in a way a therapy for him. You know, as we mature in our field, in our thinking, I think we begin to trust our intuition in a deeper way and it brings out the kinds of stories within ourselves that we believe have a universality to them. If I'd had an easy life, there would be no pictures, I guess. So the pictures come out of trying to solve, trying to sort things out. Raphael's new body of work, Beautifully Broken, is an introspective study of his aging process. It's like um, a mother and father who are um, in their 80s and their child who's in his 60s. These magnificent, magnificent photographs. For me, it's the most autobiographical of all his series of works. Now I'm seeing detail here that I didn't see on the screen. I don't remember seeing that. Yeah, this looks wonderful. He uses the physical landscape to reference what he himself is feeling in the decaying and the breakdown of his body and the problems involved with aging. We can see a certain suffering in his soul and I think that this is one of his most profound bodies of work. I love to see all of them at the same time. You know, in the old days when I used to print myself, it was one by one, and you could only see one, one of them at a time, right? You can see the show all at once, coming out on the road. Of course, these are images of me. Even inner brokenness can be photographed. I am acutely aware of the perishable nature of the material of which we are made and also aware in an uncomfortable kind of way of the fact that I may not be able to do what I do 10 or 15 years down the road. I only have so much time to reduce work before my energy doesn't allow it, before uh, the onset or something that will prevent me from doing it. Maybe I, I have a much shorter period of time I'm really not taking the future for granted, given the power of genetics. Seeing my mother decline, I may be more like her than I am like my father. I may be a victim to what she's following a victim to. The space between the three images looks good too. Looks good. And beyond that, I think there's a beauty in that. There's that layer as well that I'm trying to capture in the work is that it's a melancholic and beautiful decadence. There have been many stages in my life, almost like many lifetimes. And my work looking back seems to reflect each one of those lifetimes. Eventually, there's no difference between creator and creation, artist or parent. In my own life, perhaps I need to back off a bit and allow things to happen. Only then, past and future can connect more naturally. What's primary for me is the search, is what lies inside that is a puzzle that I need to examine and look at. Solving is too final. I will only solve it when I die. 
my contribution to other people's lives is what fills my mind these days. And what I hope will happen is that they'll remember that I tried. When the people you love stop coming by, you can still hear their voices in your dreams, read their letters, and touch their faces in old photographs. But when you start losing count of days and shape of things, then what's the point of all this exercise? Now and then I think that some very strange laws were given to us by the great designer. Well, we've stuck it out before. So now we'll stick it out again. Thank <laughs> you.